behold the sky god! Look ye on his might and despair! These were formed! They forbid? Or you forbid, Jero? Show me a sky god, so I may ask him. Hello everyone, uh, we're here at TF Expo in Wichita, Kansas, uh, and I'm with uh, Buzz Dixon, writer from uh, Transformers Generation 1. Uh, welcome to uh, TF YLP. Uh, would Thank you. Thank like you. To Thank you. Tell, uh, tell the fans a little bit about uh, what you've done and, uh, and uh, what you contributed to uh, Transformers. Uh, well, um, I was one of the original writers on G.I. Joe and Transformers. I was a... Uh, associate story editor on G.I. Joe the first season. I was a story editor of G.I. Joe the second season. I wrote for every episode that Sunbow produced at that time. It's not, excuse me, every series Sunbow produced at that time, with the exception of Air Raiders. Mm -hmm. So I did, in addition to Transformers and G.I. Joe, I worked on Inhumanoids, I worked on Visionaries, I uh, worked on Gem, and I even worked on My Little Pony. Wow. So I did the, the whole spectrum of uh, Sunbow's product at that time. We actually, we had uh, Miss uh, Samantha Newark on and uh, she told uh, told us a lot of great things about uh, Gem and the Holograms and her work on that. Mm -hmm. And then uh, uh, we had uh, Flint Dilly yeah. on uh, not, not too long ago. Well, actually it's about a year ago. Flint and I go back a long ways. We met at um, Ruby Spears Productions uh, long before Sunbow was even formed long before the Transformers were even introduced as uh, toys in the United States. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've been we've we've known each other. He's probably I've probably known him longer than anybody else who's still living in Hollywood. Yeah, he's a mm -hmm. super a super great guy. I, mm -hmm. uh, I follow him, and uh, I'm yeah. a friend of his on Facebook, and uh, mm -hmm. always. Uh, Post something interesting on there. Yeah. Uh, love, uh, love reading. Oh, stuff. let's be honest. He likes to stir things up. He'll, yeah. he will, he'll come up with the wildest political discussions <laughs> and, and uh, cultural discussions and whatnot. But he's a great guy, and he's he's uh, really a wonderful person. Most certainly is. Mm -hmm. um, so you wrote uh, how many episodes uh, did you write uh, total for G1? That's an excellent question because as a story editor, I never took credit for any writing I did and at least two or three scripts were completely written from scratch brand new by me mm -hmm. when when the original scripts did not come in high enough quality but I'm one of the people who believes as a story editor that's your job you yes. don't you don't take credit for editing somebody else's work mm -hmm. um, I co-wrote one script for Transformers with Flint Dilly um, I think that was prime target mm -hmm. I worked hand in hand with a great many other people on their scripts in terms of scripts that I actually have my name on I would say 15 mm -hmm. of, over the various series but that's that's just the guess if somebody were to tell me it was only 12 I wouldn't be surprised at that yeah. well I uh, uh, you were talking yesterday about the uh, uh, the God gambit Yes. Uh, I have to say, me personally, that is one of my favorite all-time episodes. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, it's a, a great story. Uh, I mean, it's a little bit out there, but, I mean, as, as far as the core story of that episode, mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a good little lesson, and uh, it highlights some of my favorite characters in, uh, in mm -hmm. Astral Train, Perceptor, yes. uh, Omega Supreme. Uh, the, the God Gamut was a really good story, and... Um, a lot of great characters in it. Uh, is there anything you'd like to tell the fans that might be watching? Well, as, about as I stuff? said, it it was sparked, and this is where a lot of the Joe and Transformer episodes we did, I think, have an advantage over other shows. Other shows would just do stories with a standard, um, you know, they want the MacGuffin device, and so, you know, they're fighting for it. We tried to tackle themes about real topics and at that time there had been a 
scandal where a televangelist who was raking in literally hundreds of thousands of dollars a week, I remember it, that. it turned out people were mailing their prayer requests to him with their checks and their money in it, mm -hmm. and the post office box was his bank. Mm -hmm. And the bank was opening up the letters, taking the money and the checks out, and then throwing the prayer requests away unread. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, it, don't do that to people. Don't mm -hmm. prey on their, their faith and their fears and their hopes, especially when some of these people are so desperate, this is the only thing they can think of that will help them. And that really bothered me because I'm a Christian. I don't, I don't want to see people using my faith to victimize other people. Mm -hmm. So that was the genesis of the God Gambit, that there were corrupt religious leaders on, on Titan. And by the way, I'm, I'm claiming if they find intelligent life on Titan, <laughs> I said it first. Um, but and then there will be an attack on yeah, it. Yeah, there will be an attack on it. But, <laughs> but I... Um, I wanted to comment on that, and and the the alien vi the the tribe of aliens in the story, the religious leaders of the tribe are like the Pharisees. They've come up with all the rules and the requirements that other people have to jump through. They don't have to obey, and they are faking their you know their gods here. And then of course when the uh, Autobots and the Decepticons arrive, they're mistaken for the gods. And the Decepticons are going, well, sure, you want to worship us as gods? That's perfectly all right with us. Now start ponying up the, the crystals we need. Yeah. And so I wanted to touch on that. I want to get people to think, don't be blind when somebody says, oh, I'm speaking for God or I'm this or I'm that. You question that person. You ask that person, well, what is your proof? How can you... How can we trust you to say that you are what you are? And of course, them uh, being Transformers, show yeah, them the powers. Exactly, exactly. So that was one of the things that was pushing me forward with that. And the nice thing about Transformers is that Hasbro almost never vetoed anything for thematic reasons. They might say, you know, downplay it. I think there were a couple of lines where they, they wanted it to be uh, emphatically understood we were not attacking the idea of religion we were attacking the idea of people who using it. were using it corruptly uh, so we did that we gave we made sure that 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 was in there <clears throat> Hasbro never stopped us thematically from anything we wanted to do and as a result we were able to explore a lot of stuff that other other companies just couldn't even touch fantastic uh, now is um I recall you said some things that uh, uh, you enjoyed working with the late great Scatman Crothers. Oh yeah, I love uh, him. Yeah. Do you have any stories or anything you'd like to tell about him? Or well, uh, he had just come off of The Shining, which had been directed by Stanley Kubrick, and Kubrick was a perfectionist when it came to filmmaking. And there's a a story about Kubrick and Jack Nicholson. Uh, Kubrick making Nicholson do something again and again and uh, Nicholson basically saying well how many times do you expect me to do this and, and Kubrick said until you get it right he said I've been thinking about this movie for four years and I'm gonna get it done exactly the way I see it being done and Scatman had a similar problem and I don't know if he was exaggerating or not but he claimed he had to walk across the street 87 times before before Kubrick was satisfied with the way he crossed the street. Mm -hmm. And you think that's ridiculous, but when you read about the attention to detail that Kubrick put in on these films, you go, it may be an exaggeration, but it's not untrue. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he one demanded of my, a lot. One of my personal favorite uh, films of uh, all time is the Stanley Kubrick friend, the film uh, Full Metal Jacket. Mm -hmm. uh, Excellent love that. film. Love Excellent that film. film, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's great. Now, uh, your favorite memory of working on Transformers? Anything in particular that stands mm. out? I have a lot of excellent memories. Um, there was nothing that was a negative memory for me that happened at that time. I, I had a good job. I had people I admired and enjoyed working with. I was working on a show that um, then and now was recognized as being several steps above Mm -hmm. What else was being done? Um, I was being paid well for it. Um, 
I have I have little specific memories. I mean, I just told in one of the panels we had a, a female employee who at lunchtime used to go up on the roof of the office building we were in and sunbathe, and we knew this, mm. and so we we just stayed away from the roof. And one day we're eating lunch in the conference room, and the uh, telephone repair guy comes in and says, "We're upgrading the phone system. Where's the junction box?" Without thinking, we go, "It's on the roof." And uh, the next thing we hear is a scream from up here, and and the guy comes down red faced, <laughs> and he's followed by the the female employee who's pulling her clothes on frantically and saying, "Don't ever do that!" You know? <laughs> so <laughs> that's hilarious. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now. Transformers, obviously, we're we're in a uh, room filled with uh, fans, uh, mm -hmm. toys, and, yeah. and, and everything. Um, and here we are, 31 years uh, after mm -hmm. it aired, and it, I mean, it really revolutionized uh, kids' toys and mm -hmm. uh, and everything. Uh, I've told the story many times on on our podcast, and uh, and I've. Uh, I've Met uh, Michael McConaughey, uh, Mr. Mm -hmm. Dan Gilvezan. I told uh, told them all my, my story as a child. I, I was a very sick little kid, mm -hmm. and um, I had a heart disease, and I couldn't run and play with all the uh, all the other kids. So a lot of the times, what I had to do was sit inside, and play with my Transformer toys, mm -hmm. and that that cartoon it it kept me happy. The cartoon, oh, the toys, uh, it really meant something to me. Uh, and that, like I said, the God Gambit, um, it actually had a message to it. And mm -hmm. it, I know we talked uh, a little bit about this, and I want to I want to hear your reaction. Um, we talked a little bit about this with uh, uh, Flint Dilly. Um, a lot of times, especially uh, cartoons revolving around Transformers uh, or toys in general. Mm -hmm. um, are labeled as 25, 30 minute cartoon mm -hmm. or, or commercials, commercials for toys. Mm -hmm. uh, what is your uh, answer to that? I mean, given that we have such gems as like uh, the God well, Gambit. I'll give you an answer, and the answer is is that one of the best uh, dramatic TV series that was ever written was the 1960s TV series Route 66, mm -hmm. and that was an hour long advertisement for Corvettes. Mm -hmm. That's how that was funded. Uh, Chevrolet said we. We are changing the design of the Corvette. We want to promote this new design, and we'll give you a car if you'll build a show around it. And they said, sure. And they did one of the best series that has ever been put on the air. Mm -hmm. And they didn't do it by shoving the car in everybody's face, but Route 66, the, the two heroes are traveling from town to town in every episode. Mm -hmm. The way they got there was by car. So I don't have a problem with using toys or any commercial item or something to like that to, yes. to drive interest, to create interest, to create the basis that a series is, is going to be based on. Um, at a certain point, you, you do want to say to the, to the people who own the property, you know, now you're becoming intrusive. Now you're starting to push it too hard. When we started doing Transformers and G.I. Joe, we would get a, a sheet of paper that would say, it, we want to do an episode where these characters are used and these accessories are used and in the case of G.I. Joe these vehicles are used mm -hmm. and as often as not it was like a grab bag I mean it really didn't make sense you'd have the Arctic guy and the underwater guy and they'd yeah. all be mixed together and in a certain way that worked because it, it forced you to be inventive in coming up with a show that would have those two characters in it but <clears throat> After about like the, the, the fifth or sixth week, they realize, well, these guys, we don't have to tell them what to use because they'll use every tool that they have, you know, accessible to them. Mm -hmm. they, will, they will reach in there and they'll grab stuff out and they'll use it and they'll use it in more imaginative ways than we can. So at that point, they realize, you know, we were, we were safe in so far as we would come up, we would be using the stuff that were in the product line. So at that point, they left us alone. We just developed stuff. Every once in a great while, we'd get something like, you know, we've seen we've seen too much of Optimus Prime for the last five weeks. You know, you can you can put him in the background for a couple of episodes, or we haven't seen enough of low light. Let's do a low light episode, something like that. Mm -hmm. But never dictating what the story was or or how to present. Just giving it you free reign of exactly, everything. Exactly, exactly. 
Um, I remember, uh, I believe it was one of the DVD extras on one of the uh, one of the uh, season uh, sets that was put. I believe it was a Rhino set. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember who said it, but um, one of the the last uh, three episodes mm -hmm. uh, that was that is attributed as season four uh, mm -hmm. in the original Transformers uh, called the Rebirth. Mm -hmm. uh, Hasbro had come out with a lot of new toys, a lot of mm -hmm. new characters, and they wanted to uh, to drive that. But the car uh, the cartoon itself was being canceled. Yeah. Uh, so basically, they said, "Here's a bunch of characters. Get as many as you can in here." Yeah. Uh, I'm sure that's very frustrating from a writing standpoint, uh, and especially building a story whenever uh, some characters aren't even on the screen for more than five seconds. Well, I mean, um, uh, I worked at Ruby Spears, as I mentioned. One of the series I worked on was um, the Mr. T Show. Mm. And in the Mr. T Show, he is a gymnast coach, and there were a whole team of teenage gymnasts, plus a dog, plus a chaperone. Basically, there were 17 characters in the show, each one of whom had to have at least one line of dialogue in every show. And so by the time you got through giving each character one line of dialogue, it was pretty much time to end the, the episode. Mm -hmm. um, that's not what you want to have happen. We had, we had conversely a better but entirely different experience with Jem and with Inhumanoids. Because both Jem and Inhumanoids were canceled, but in the case of Inhumanoids, the, the toy line was canceled while the series was halfway in production. And they, they didn't have anything to replace it with, so they said, well, just finish the series, and we pretty much don't care what you do as long as we don't get the FCC calling us to want to know why why there was wall-to-wall -wall nudity in it. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> all right, you know, we'll keep their pants on, but we'll do anything else we want to do. And as a result, we did these really offbeat, you know, crazy kind of episodes that, um, you know, people remember now, even yeah. though the toy has been forgotten. Jim... Uh, I'll, I'll say this as diplomatically as possible. Jim was one of the ugliest fashion dolls ever made. <laughs> and, and the reason for that is that Mattel owns the patent on Barbie, and you can't make a doll that has the same dimensions as Barbie. Mm -hmm. So they created this grotesque, deformed fashion doll they called Jim to be a rival of Barbie, and nobody liked it, not even the little girls it was aimed at. So the Jim doll was canceled at the end at roughly about the same time the first season was ending. Mm -hmm. But the show was so popular with young girls, even though they hated the toy, it, it just basically opened up a whole advertising, uh, a, a whole market where they could sell products to girls, even if it wasn't Jim. Mm -hmm. They kept the series going for a second year just so they would be able to advertise on it. So I, they didn't have a toy admit, line. As, as a little yeah. boy, I watched Jim myself. Yeah. Uh, mainly because, I mean, it came on around the same time block of an afternoon after school when the cartoons were coming on. Uh, Jim and the Holograms would come on, G.I. Joe, Transformers, Rescue Rangers, uh, you know, things like that. And the low-cut mini dresses had nothing to do with it. Just a little. Just a little. Uh, <laughs> it's like, it's, it's, you know, it's a funny thing because we will do shows and we will create characters in them and we don't think of those characters as being, you know, quote, sexy because to us they're just characters. Mm -hmm. And then we find out without knowing it, we, we ended up pushing a lot of buttons. And even though the characters were not meant to be perceived as desirable, for some people they look at it, I mean perfect example is Duke. I mm. mean, in G.I. Joe, there are a lot of, of ladies who just identify him as, well, that's what they, their idea of what a real man is, mm -hmm. is Duke. And we didn't set out with that in mind. If we had tried to create a, a character that was going to be a heartthrob, we would have failed miserably. Mm -hmm. But we just created a heroic character, and it, it happened to fill that niche. Well, there was, there was a small character in the third season of uh, Transformers, uh, Marissa Fairborn, yeah. uh, who yeah. was, I, I believe, supposed to be the daughter of Duke, yeah. and uh, was it Lady yeah. J? I believe I so, like, yeah. Um, she, she was actually, I mean, her character... I'm not, and I don't mean this in a physical sense, since it's a cartoon. But I mean, she had an attractive character. Her, yeah. Her her whole character just right. was very alluring. And yeah. You know, uh, some of the recent years of Transformers mm -hmm. uh, cartoons uh, are a lot of people say there's a lot of annoying kids in. Them. Uh, mm -hmm. But whenever you talk about Generation One, 
the human characters weren't annoying. They they played a part. Yeah. Uh, I mean, even from from uh, uh, Spike and, and Sparkplug down to uh, 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 Sean Berger. Mm -hmm. You know, they they weren't annoying. They you know they might have been stereotypical at times. I, I remember uh, uh, Thief in the Night in season mm -hmm. three. Uh, Casey Kasem had an issue with yeah. uh, uh, Abdul Fakadi. Uh. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's uh, it's been a little documented, but yeah. Uh, but the thing is, the characters were memorable. Yeah, well, and we, and that's what that's what's important. We try we tried to give them. We tried to give every good character some. I won't say bad, but some negative aspect that they had to work against. They had a, they had something in their personality they had to hold in check at the very least. Mm -hmm. We had every bad character, we tried to give them some sort, I won't say necessarily a redeeming quality, but there had to be something about them that, that you liked. Um, you know, maybe it was it was loyalty within the group. Maybe it was a willingness to you know, endure terrible things for something you believed in, but nonetheless, we tried to give everyone something that if, if you couldn't root for it, you could at least say, well, I could understand why this person would do that. Mm -hmm. um, too often, people come up with, with, this character is bad, you know, and that's it, and this character is good. I mean, the classic example is, um, and it was used for satirical purposes, you go to uh, Blake Edwards' movie, The Great Race, mm -hmm. and he's got Tony Curtis as the great Leslie, who's, who is always dressed impeccably in white, and his teeth are gleaming every time he smiles. And then you have uh, Jack Lemmon as Professor Fate, and he looks for all the world like Jack the Ripper. I mean, he's, you know, black cloak, dark hat, big handlebar mustache. And yet, even though they are meant to be caricatures of absolute good and absolute evil, Nonetheless, you can recognize, well, Leslie has his shortcomings, and Professor Fate isn't as bad as he seems to be. There, Fate, Professor Fate would actually, when, when it made sense, make peace with the le great Leslie and mm -hmm. would cooperate with him. Mm -hmm. You know, too often you have these, these um, characters where if you have... If you're doing a, a Joker versus Batman story, Joker, regardless of the circumstances, is going to try to... Joker would be a bad example because Joker's crazy. He would do it. He'd be willing to die to hurt Batman. But if you had the Riddler or Penguin or Catwoman and, and the only chance of both surviving is by cooperating, those characters have enough sense to say, okay, bury the hatchet, we're going to cooperate until we survive. That was at least what Professor Fate had. He had enough sense to recognize, we're going to die if we don't cooperate, I'll cooperate. The moment I, we're not going to die, I'm going to stab you in the back. But he at least had enough sense to cooperate when it was in his best interest to. And we tried to get that across with the, the uh, G.I. Joe series. Um, we, we, we wanted, and, and not just G.I. Joe, but Transformers as well. These, these were not just figures that were flying around doing things for arbitrary reasons. They had motivations. They had things that pushed them forward. We tried to make that come across in the stories. Um, okay. Uh, is there any one particular Transformer character that you enjoyed writing? Oh, Jazz, Jazz, absolutely, yeah, because, and, and for a very selfish reason, every time I got to write Jazz, I got to go into the recording session and, and hang out with Scatman Crothers, you know, and if, if, uh, if it would give me a chance to hang out with Scatman, I'd do it. Now, it was said that uh, he was supposed to be a continuing character in season three, but unfortunately, uh, he passed away uh, right before the third season was to air. Yeah, I think uh, so. He was animated, I believe, in the first episode of uh, Five Faces of Darkness. Uh, but was not obviously uh, there was no yeah. voice attributed to him, and his, I think his character was renamed something. Yeah. Uh, just and he was made a background character. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's and that's sad. But uh, and you can't beat the fact that if he turned into a Porsche 911. So. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> um, have you had, for our younger fans? Uh, have you had a chance to see any of the? 
uh, newer Transformer series, well, even Beast Wars. I, I, I have given this answer more than once at the convention, and I'm, I'll give it again, and I will preface it the way I've given it before. And this is not a judgment call. Mm -hmm. I'm not evaluating anything that was done after us. Yeah. But personally, I'm the type of person that once my creative duties on something is done, yeah. I put it down, I walk away from it, mm -hmm. and I don't look back. I mean, I, I obviously look back in so far as I say I really am proud of what we did for Transformers. Mm -hmm. I'm very happy I worked on Transformers. I'm, I'm obviously happy to be here talking with you and other mm -hmm. people about uh, the series and whatnot. But I didn't have a compelling need to see what other people were doing with it after I left. Yeah. I, I was done. I, would, I, I could imagine myself only getting upset and not getting being pleased at the time because I would have said, well, that's not what you should have done. And it was no longer my ballywick to say what should be done. Because I was, um, I didn't own the characters. I didn't create the characters. Uh, it was not my place to decide what could and couldn't be done with them. So once the responsibility was taken from me, hands off, and I just I, walk away from I it. totally understand that. I mean, I, I think the reason uh, a lot of fans ask that question is that, well, since you guys wrote uh, the original stories uh, that uh, surrounded these characters, and then as we as we all can see, the, the franchise has continued on after Generation 1, uh, you know, uh, it just begs the question, you know, did you ever stop in and see, you know, how more ca your characters were continued or anything like that? And I guess that's what causes people to ask that. I, I understand why people ask that question. And again, all I can I can say is, for my own sanity, once I put it down, I walk away. <laughs> Don't go from back. It. Yeah, that's, I, yeah. I, I totally get that. You know, it's even even at my work, yeah. whenever I go home from yeah. work. I don't think about it, not yep. until I need to go back to it. Exactly. So, I mean, it's, it's totally understandable. I mean, I have I have my own projects that I'm doing now that well, I that, control. That was my next question. Um, I've, got, I've got a book coming out called Poor Banished Children of Eve, which is a young adult adventure. I describe it as a World War II Lord of the Flies with Catholic schoolgirls. Huh. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, it's a group of girls who are being evacuated from the Philippines on the eve of World War II. Their plane is shot down, and the few who survive are shipwrecked on a desert island while the war rages around them. Mm -hmm. I'm, I have completed the first draft and am beginning the rewrite on a book called The Rustlers of Rimrock, which is about four girls who save a herd of wild horses. That's a contemporary rep western that I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm about halfway through with a Kindle Worlds novel called The Most Dangerous Man in the World, which is based on the G.I. Joe episode that I wanted to do but wasn't able to do. Oh, wow. When I was uh, assuming the duties as the story editor for the second season of G.I. Joe, I wanted to do a story that explained, at least in the animated version, what the origin of Cobra was. And in my, in my version, there was a uh, Frederick Nietzsche, Karl Marx type character who basically created the philosophy that Cobra was based on, mm -hmm. but Cobra Commander bungled it so badly, messed up the philosophy so badly, that this guy was trying to convince people not to follow Cobra Commander. So Cobra Commander had him imprisoned. He escapes from Cobra's prison, and when he does, um, Cobra Commander stops all Cobra activity worldwide and has Cobra looking for this guy. Mm -hmm. The Joes have no idea who he is, but they know if Cobra wants him, they have to get him first. And so there's a race between Cobra and the Joes to find this guy. And when the Joes find him, he turns out to be a really obnoxious guy. Nobody likes him. <laughs> and when he escapes from the Joes, the Joes go, eh, you know, forget it. Just, just let him go. You know, it doesn't matter to us. But at least it was going to explain the origin of, um, of Cobra in the animated series. And Hasbro accepted that. They, they thought it was a great idea. They said, go ahead, start working on it. Uh, just make sure there's a place for the Cobra Emperor in it. And I said, the who? And they said, the Cobra Emperor. And I said, well, who's the Cobra Emperor? And they said, well, he's Cobra Commander's uh, superior. And I said, no, he's not. There so we've no. done a whole series where Cobra Commander is the supreme authority in Cobra. If you had told us last year, 
you know, plant little hints that there might be somebody above him, we'd be happy to do hence, that. Hence how Serpentor was a created Exactly, yeah. exactly. Okay. So uh, I've told the story, if you've, those of you who at, at home who have the Shout Factory edition of uh, G.I. Joe the movie, listen to the commentary, I explain all about how we got there. But um, I didn't get a chance to do The Most Dangerous Man in the World. I'm now doing it as a novel for Kindle Worlds and it will be available sometime this year. And uh, and that's the most dangerous man in the, the world? The most dangerous man in the world. Not to be confused with a G.I. Joe episode called The Most Dangerous Thing in the World, <laughs> which is a different matter entirely. Um, okay, one last question. Uh, is there any Transformer story uh, that you wanted to tell uh, but weren't able to? Hmm. Um, I would say that probably at the time there must have been like six or eight ideas that we had jotted down that you know if we had the if we if we were working on the show the next season we wanted to tackle those mm -hmm. and once we were no longer working on the show um, since they were so specific to Transformers those ideas pretty much evaporated mm -hmm. so maybe is the best answer I can give you. No, uh, no specifics and everything. Oh, and the screen is falling asleep. Well, uh, Buzz, I'd like to thank you for being on I the show. I was happy to be here. Um, and, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to welcome you back anytime. Uh, we, we do broadcast live. Uh, for those of you who are first check, mm -hmm. checking us out here, we broadcast live on YouTube every Friday night at 9 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we uh, use Google Plus Hangouts to, uh, to uh, do that, and uh, uh, then there's an audio version released uh, usually a day or so later. So uh, check us out on there. Also, check out our sponsor, uh, Capture Prey. Great toys, great prices, great service. Uh, CaptureProy.com. Uh, okay. Buzz, thank you for joining us. Thank you. We'll thank see you, you next much. time. Absolutely. See you, everyone. Transform!